Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Jim Hartnett, Jr. from the Hartnett Law Firm in Dallas, Texas. After graduating from Austin College, where he also played varsity basketball, Mr. Hartnett received his law degree from the University of Texas School of Law. His practice focuses on probate and trust litigation, and he's tried many of Texas's biggest probate and trust cases, all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court. Mr. Hartnett's been selected by Texas Law as Texas's go-to attorney for trust and estate litigation, and is listed in the best lawyers in America. His, specifically, his jury verdict in the 2010 case, Cruciani versus Budd, is listed in the Texas Lawyers Verdict Hall of Fame. Mr. Hartnett's a member of the Dallas Bar Association and the State Bar of Texas, as well as a former council member of the probate and estate planning section of the DBA. Additionally, Mr. Hartnett is a fellow of the Texas Bar Foundation, as well as a former barrister in the Patrick Higginbotham American Inn of the Court. Mr. Hartnett's presentation today is entitled, Representing Fiduciaries Who Have Breached Their Fiduciary Duties. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Hartnett. Thanks, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry if I uh, fouled things up with my travel plans today. I was the one who uh, flipped with uh, Jerry because my flight was canceled this morning. So I'm going to talk about what to do when you represent a fiduciary who's breached his fiduciary duties. Uh, and, and you pretty much know it, and I don't know if many of you have had that pleasure. I've done it quite a few times, although most of the time I'm probably on the, uh, on the plaintiff side. Um, the, the first question that you have to decide uh, or look at is, um, what do you want to do? All right? You, you're going to decide to, early on, do you fight? or do you let the trustee get out? And my experience is most time defense lawyers don't think about offering the trustee's resignation almost immediately. But in my experience, more often than not, that's primarily what the beneficiary wants, is to get rid of the trustee or get rid of the managing partner or whoever's in control of their lives. And so just simply offering to resign in return for a release often ends the case right then and there. That can, trading your resignation for a release can also work late. Uh, it generally doesn't work, uh, works either real early or real late when the beneficiary is worn out and just can't take it anymore and at that point will settle for just about anything. The second decision to make, or at the same time, is whether he's gonna hang on and fight. And most of the time, folks, it seems to me that, that the fiduciary is often focused on, hey, this is about me. And it's really not. You know, it's, it's really about getting them out of the trap as fast as they can, but they think hanging on to the trust relationship or hanging on as managing partner is, is really that important. They don't realize uh, all the the pitfalls that face them. A lot of times, for example, you'll you'll see a trustee who got appointed by his best friend to handle the trust for the best friend's kids. He actually thinks the trust relationship is about him. That this is what the tr the settlor wanted to do. Wanted me to do this. This is about me, not about the beneficiaries. And so, disabusing of them them of that approach or that thought is one of the first things that you have to do. If you're going to um, have the fight, you're gonna continue on with it, one of the things you need to let your client know is that it, if they don't want you, it's only a matter of time because the beneficiaries are gonna sue you over and over and over again if you're a fiduciary that they don't want. If they don't knock you out on the first one, they'll knock you out on the second try or the third try. I've had several cases where it was on the second lawsuit that the trustee got really hammered. Um, one thing that people don't seem to grasp is that in a fiduciary relationship, res judicata is not particularly helpful because every day is potentially a new breach of fiduciary duty. And so even if you get them released as of you have a trial, you survive, they're still there. Well, the clock, clock starts ticking on everything that happens after that. Typically, if the beneficiary is dissatisfied with the result of a trial or whatever happened in the first try, they're gonna try again. 
Another uh, option to consider is, let's see if I can make this go, is whether you're fighting for the fiduciary or the trust. This is a tough call because you don't want to ignore what the settlor or the creator of the partnership or whoever, what their intent was. But at the same time, you're representing an individual who is under a serious attack. And you owe it to that individual to try and get him out. One of the best ways to do that is just to terminate the trust, which a lot of beneficiaries want. Now, when you're making this call, you're weighing protecting the trustee or executor or whoever with the wishes of the settlor or the testator. I think it's a pretty easy call because I don't think any settlor or testator in particular want their brother, their, their oldest son, their oldest daughter, their best friend, whoever, in the middle of a lawsuit that is going to drain the trust, drain his resources, and put that fiduciary at risk. I think uh, termination of the trust or modification of the trust often can lead to letting a a fiduciary who's breached his fiduciary duties in a significant fashion will often give them an opportunity to get out. Okay, why do you want to get rid of these things early? Well, for starters, it might be criminal. And very few lawyers give any consideration to this because you don't really hear about it very much. But there are two penal statutes that directly implicate the conduct of fiduciaries, and man, they are powerful. Uh, the first one is 3243, and it's really a bribery, uh, more of a bribery um, penal code section. Let's see if I can get this to work. But it talks about accepting any benefit from another person on agreement or understanding that the benefit will influence the conduct of the fiduciary in the relation to the affairs of the beneficiary. So that could be uh, accepting some kind of money or benefit from another person to sell property or to move trust assets, for example, to be invested. That's a, a, uh, a state jail felony. The one that's most uh, applicable is 3245, which is misapplication of fiduciary property. And this is basically if you misapply the property in any way that brings substantial risk to the beneficiary or really to the fund. Borrowing money, borrowing money insecured, taking the money, causing the trust to buy your dumpy property, all of that technically falls under this penal code statute. Well, what people don't really understand is the significance, too, of these. So this is a first-degree felony if it's more than $200,000. How does five to 99 years in a penitentiary sound? That's the punishment for misapplication of fiduciary funds of $200,000 or more. Just $1,500 gets you to 180 days to two years in jail. Okay, the, when you're looking at the, at the prospect of criminal liability, um, the reality is these cases are not high on the list of a DA unless they involve a minor child or an elderly citizen. Elder abuse, we're all hearing a lot about that now, and that has the attention of, of local law enforcement and prosecutors. Minors have always had some special protection. In fact, if you look at the misapplication, if you look at 3245, misapplication of uh, fiduciary funds, it specifically provides that all of the levels of the crime based on the amount are ramped up if it involves misapplying the uh, finances of a elderly beneficiary. So 
it, if it's a minor or an elder, you need to really be careful. If it's just the, uh, you know, garden variety breach of fiduciary duty or misapplication of partnership funds, and you're dealing in particular with family members, well, a lot of times the DAs don't want to mess with that. Um, they don't want to mess with it because A, they don't have the resources, B, they see it as more of a civil dispute, and C, they see it as a family feud, and family feuds can be a lot dicier with a jury, uh, more apt to give Uncle Joe a break than punish some disinterested uh, fiduciary. But when they look at it, obviously, the bigger the, the borrowing or theft or misapplication, the more likely they're going to pick it up. Family relationship, again, is going to make it less likely they pick it up. The age, I've already talked about. The economic factors, uh, how it implicate, how it impacts the trust is very significant. If they wipe out the trust, for example, it's going to make it much, much easier for somebody to take it. One thing I'll tell you that you, you, you'd think it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually the smaller cases that seem to get more attention from district attorneys. And the reason is because the beneficiary typically doesn't have the money to fight the fight. And so lawyers are telling them, go to the DA. And they do. And occasionally they get the district attorney to bite. If, if the beneficiary is um, feeling the pressure, it may not start out. You may see the criminal exposure. They may not. But as the beneficiary uh, starts to swallow hard on the cost, they start looking for other options and they'll stumble on to the criminal prosecution. I've probably only been successful at getting a fiduciary prosecuted twice. Um, it's difficult because the DAs are understaffed. They're very quick to say, well, the trust was written in Dallas, go there. The fiduciary lives in, in uh, Liberty County, go there. The money got sent to Travis County, go there. But if you package it up, in a way that makes it clear to them that this is going to be very easy, we just need to follow what this lawyer gave me, you can convince them to get it. And one of the benefits for that beneficiary who can't afford it, in one case we had a similar situation, it was about 900000 had been taken, and the restitution order was $950,000. Uh, so the man had probation, the trustee got probation, and had to, uh, had a restitution order that compelled him to pay $950,000. So you, you recovered some money without having really to do anything. The DA pretty much did it all. By the way, we turned to that because the clients couldn't really afford it, number one, and number two, because the money was so well hidden. And it was going to be much harder for us to get it than law enforcement, especially with a restitution order. All right, so you, you decide you're going to keep going forward, you're not too worried about the criminal penalties, or you can't get uh, the, the trustee out for a resignation in, uh, or termination of the trust, well, then you need to focus on some damage control. And you want to mitigate by repaying the loans, canceling the self-dealing transaction if you can, refunding excessive compensation, the biggest one is disclose, disclose, and keep disclosing. Um, basically, if you refund the money, if you pay the, uh, the loans back, you're still on the hook. You still have liability. You still have liability for profits. You still have disgorgement remedies that can be used against you. But you're going to look a lot better and you're going to minimize the likelihood that anyone is going to continue to pursue you because the pool of damages is, is going to shrink. Um, so, you know, they never want to give the money back. I was just doing a, a case in San Antonio where the guy took the trust money, bought the property, voila, there's uh, Eagleford royalties on the property, He's not about to part with those royalties, and so he's not interested in letting that go. 
Well, consequently, the lawsuit is building and building, and there's already a summary judgment that he, he breached his fiduciary duties. Um, one that people just don't seem to get behind is meet with the beneficiary early. Show some contrition, but more importantly, show that you care about what the beneficiary says. The typical reaction is to clam up and go into defensive mode. No, you need to be very upfront. And when I say you, I'm talking about the trustee. So the lawyer needs to get the trustee to face up to the beneficiary, face up to the problem, give the beneficiary a chance to vent. Um, many of you, if you've, you've probably been in some cases where somebody took a deposition and the case was ready to settle, or you went to a mediation early and the beneficiary got an opportunity to tell their story to somebody, and then they were ready to try and work it out. We've, we've resolved plenty up front by meeting with the beneficiaries and just doing a little bit of mea culpa. Probably the most important thing to do in damage control is don't retaliate. I probably see this done more often than any other tactic. And folks, this is page one of the how to blow your client up playbook. The uh, lawyer tells the trustee, you got no problems here. We're going to be very aggressive. We're going to crush these people. And it just spirals off into, they skip World War III and go straight to World War VII. So don't make it difficult to get information. I'm a, give them everything. Whatever it is, give it to them. Your client is balking at giving it to him, force him to give him the information. Whatever it is, I mean, people fight about tax returns and things like that. Who cares? I mean, some good lawyer is going to get all that information, give them the tax returns, give them all the documents, give them everything that they could possibly ask for, because at some point, they're going to get it. And meanwhile, you're going to look bad. And let me give you an example of how this is going to come in. So you assume that discovery fights, for example, are not admissible in a trial. Well, that lawyer representing that beneficiary is going to try and get attorney's fees under the trust code or under the DJ action. And one of the ways he's going to justify his attorney's fees is showing all the discovery fights that he went through. It's a backdoor way of getting in how difficult it was to get the information. Can't get into the details as much, but you can tell the story about how they were holding up information. How about this one? Cutting off distributions. And, uh, you know, to, to pick a case that came in Judge DeShazo's court years ago, I mean, we're talking a multi-hundred million dollar trust. And the very first thing the lawyers did representing the trustee, was to write a letter saying, we're ceasing all distributions from this discretionary trust. Well, you might suspect that became exhibit one in our breach of fiduciary duty case. And of course, they backpedaled a week later because they realized how bad it was going to backfire. But at that point, they've already, they'd already stepped in it. Uh, don't make them jump through a bunch of hoops to get the information to get the money, make it easy for them, by all means, let's kick them out. And that's another one that I've seen multiple times, both in, in, uh, with, ex, it, with forfeiture clauses that trustees try to use, or in, like, for example, a partnership agreement. Uh, this uh, partnership agreement said, should any partner contest by legal action any management decision made by the managing partner, he may expel such partner. Uh, now that Judge DeShazo, to pick another Judge DeShazo case, actually threw this out on uh, public policy. For some bizarre reason, the Dallas Court of Appeals said that this did not violate public policy, but said that a beneficiary or a partner could still sue a managing partner or a fiduciary for breach of fiduciary duty without pain of forfeiture. But can you imagine the reaction to that? Is that gonna, 
is that going to sm smooth things out for everybody, or is that going to escalate the fight? Uh, this case, we finally resolved as we were about to start our third jury trial. There had been uh, two jury trials, two appeals, and we were just starting the third jury trial before the, the uh, party said no mas. All right, so forfeiture clauses are really dicey. Uh, I don't think a trustee, an executor, should ever assert a forfeiture. That just seems so contrary to the, uh, to the exercise of your duty of loyalty to a beneficiary. And so if you're going to do this, it has to be 100% crystal clear. But even then, it's going to look horrible. Let some other beneficiary or somebody else do that. Uh, trying to use the uh, forfeiture provision as a fiduciary, as a defensive mechanism, is pretty much assured to backfire. I've, I've seen it work one time prior to litigation where there was a suitable carrot in a will, so it wasn't a fiduciary duty claim, it was actually a will contest, and the carrot was big enough so that it worked, but in a fiduciary context, I've never seen it work. I've seen plenty of fiduciaries who've tried to use it, who've tried to expel a beneficiary for whatever reason, and mind you, some, uh, some uh, forfeiture clauses will say if a beneficiary challenges any action taken by the executor, they forfeit. Now, most of those are going to be against public policy. There is a case, though, out of, out of Fort Worth, tried in Fort Worth, that went through the Dallas Court of Appeals, and I can't remember the style, but it's Hyder, H-Y-D-E-R, where the lawyer son forfeited because he sued his mother as trustee. And it's a little convoluted, and I think it really turned on he didn't plead public policy exception to that exculpatory clause, and therefore he couldn't raise it on appeal, and they upheld the forfeiture. I don't think it's particularly helpful, but it is, it is out there. Okay, so the next step is to try and find a get out of jail free card. And the simplest one is insurance. Um, my, my professional liability policy covers fiduciary uh, breaches. And so lots of people don't realize they have it, but obviously brokers are apt to have it, bankers, D&O uh, uh, directors and officers insurance, errors and omissions insurance, some uh, CGL policies might cover it. One thing you want to do is figure out what insurance is there and then let the other side know so that they can uh, maybe craft their claim to more of a negligence claim or something like that to bring it under the policy. That'd be the first thing I'd be looking at. Also, indemnification sometimes is in the documents, in particular, some partnership documents. Um, safe harbors in the documents. There might be lots of them. Uh, broad exculpatory clauses can be helpful. Trot them out early um, and, and really drill down on whether you can make it work. Even if you can't make it work, obviously you want to talk about it. But it's a, um, uh, the exculpatory clauses are written so randomly, it seems to me. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the case I was just doing in San Antonio, it says uh, you'll be exculpated from anything except gross, uh, gross negligence, fraud, and defalcation. Well, the problem with that one is any breach of fiduciary duty is by definition a defalcation if it involves the misapplication of funds. So that exculpatory clause probably doesn't even apply to the trustee that we're suing. Um, but the other thing is you've got to look at your guy's or your lady's conduct because if it, some of it's going to be so crystal clear that you don't even, you know the exculpatory clause isn't really going to help you. Um, specific exculpatory clauses, uh, people are looking for that 
real clear, simple one, but in that boilerplate may be causes that exculpate liability in other places. I'm going to show a couple in just a second. Special directives that tell the trustee how to do things give them some protection. Modifications of duties can be literally just buried in the document, but that might mitigate, for example, relieving somebody of the prudent man rule or something like that. Different state law. Um, I, I got into a case that had been going on for two years and nobody had bothered, it was in Texas, and nobody had bothered to look at the choice of law provision that the set law had used where he said, this trust shall be governed by Delaware law. Now there's some question about whether a Texas judge in the administration of the trust is going to apply Texas law to a Texas trustee or will apply, apply Delaware law. I've had judges go both ways on that. But if the law is different, and oftentimes it is, you want to make use of it. So that's one of the first things that I look at in a trust. It can be a Texas trust and still be governed by Delaware law, Nevada law, South Dakota law, Alaska, wherever. Okay, so let's look at a couple of, of documents here. And these are going to be pretty wordy, but here's one that's relieving the trustee for decisions made by an investment selector, like maybe a trust protector, you hear about that, this one that was called an investment selector. And basically, whatever the investment selector did, the trustee had no liability for. The next one is uh, the investment selector is relieved of the duty to diversify trust assets. Uh, they specifically waived it. Uh, another one is uh, allows self-dealing by the trustee, allows you to deal with any beneficiary or trustee under the trust acting individually. And I've pulled these out of a variety of, of documents, but a couple of them come from the same ones. Um, and then here's one that talks about, this is a Texas trust, talking about uh, the liabilities imposed or conferred by Delaware law. So those are just a couple of examples, I'm going to skip the next one here, of where you can find these, these uh, provisions in the trust document. You know, nobody wants to read that boilerplate. And I chastise lawyers all the time, draftsmen, for not reading their boilerplate because in the contest world, the boilerplate could really come back to haunt you. But when you're defending a trustee, the boilerplate can really be pretty helpful oftentimes, especially if you've used a, fo a form where maybe the trustee was actively involved in the drafting. For example, a bank. Oftentimes, estate planners will be trying to get the bank to agree to serve. And so the bank says, well, I'll serve if you do this, this, this. It ends up in the document. Then it gets transferred to another form. And so Uncle Joe has the benefit of some of that same boilerplate. All right, so you're, now you're getting ready for the fight. You want to look at every possible defense. Some of the defenses don't work like you would think. Uh, ratification, consent, things of that nature can work for a trustee. The problem with that is that there has to be disclosure. There has to be full disclosure in almost every one of those defenses for them to kick in. And um, I've seen some pretty blatant uh, ratification situations that survived summary judgment uh, because there was, the evidence was that there had been, not been near enough disclosure. Um, limitations is an, is an obvious one to pick. And in my paper, I've provided you with a, a recent case where I lost uh, at the appellate court. I wasn't involved in the trial, but picked it up at the appellate court. It's called Moxagimba, and it's out of San Antonio, and it's still in the appellate process, so hopefully I, I, I'll be able to flip it. But what it, it stems from is a breach of fiduciary duty case where the San Antonio Court of Appeals said the discovery rule did not apply. And there are all kinds of cases that say discovery rule typically applies in a breach of fiduciary duty case. 
Well, in this particular case, my adversary, a very, very fine lawyer in San Antonio, Joyce Moore, that some of you might have met before, Joyce drilled down very hard on the prongs that were used in to determine whether you meet the discovery uh, rule or not and got a summary judgment in a smaller county in South Texas. I came in for the appeal. Guys, I thought this was going to be easy to flip. And the Court of Appeals uh, affirmed the summary judgment saying that we could not show that the cause of action was objectively verifiable. Um, we're still in rehearing. The Supreme Court might touch it. I doubt it. But that case, you, you ought to watch it. It might help because I think it will be one that you can use to change the standard about whether uh, the beneficiary's claims against your fiduciary are told by uh, the discovery rule. Most claims, by the way, in fiduciary duty cases are stale. Um, the beneficiary might know their things aren't quite hunky-dory, or the partner might know that, but they don't want to rock the boat, and they let it go, and usually it's a combination of a series of breaches uh, that push them over the top, or all of a sudden the money dries up, or uh, you know the trustee was mean to me, or something of that nature. All right, um, obviously you want to plead the, the exculpatory clause early. Um, try and tailor everything to bring you under that. Guys, that's not going to work if your uh, trustee or your managing partner is being a complete jerk during the litigation. Exculpatory clauses kind of fall in that equity category. You want to show that you've been doing right. And that means not just your client, but you, the lawyer. Um, I've, I've seen now a couple of cases, just to give you an example, uh, that's kind of extreme, where, where uh, parties who were found to have unduly influenced in will contests got their attorney's fees for defending the will in good faith. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens because the jury likes the lawyer, likes the way the lawyer conducted himself, and gives them the benefit of the doubt. When you're defending a fiduciary, you want to take on that exact kind of approach. You want to be Mr. Everyman. You want to be uh, courteous to everybody. You don't want to be overly aggressive. You want to be disclosing everything. You want to make everything easy. So when you get to court, you can say, we were here in the epitome of good faith. Maybe not when the trustee was stealing the money, but certainly when we, the case started. Uh, discretion is a, is a you know, is a good safe harbor, but people misunderstand discretion and they focus on things like absolute discretion. If I have absolute discretion, I can lend money to myself. No, you can't do that. You can't lend money to yourself from a trust unless it specifically authorizes it. But people just assume that absolute discretion means absolute. Well, it doesn't. So a trustee vested with discretionary power is bound to use reasonable prudence. His possession of full power or wide discretion is, is not the same as unrestrained individual powers. Another case that's uh, kind of similar, uh, they talk about absolute discretion having a different meaning from discretion, but then basically say it's no different because you can't ar act arbitrarily. So there are limits to what you can do. Okay, let's kind of jump through some of this. Um, reliance on counsel. A lot of uh, trustees will say, hey, I relied on the lawyer to tell me what to do. Um, that's okay. That's going to open up uh, your communications with your lawyer and going to bust the privilege with your lawyer as an administrator. Uh, most juries, I don't think, care if you relied on your lawyer. I don't think they're gonna, that's going to change in their mind whether you breached your fiduciary duty. No damage is not much of a defense because there's disgorgement of profits. Higher interest rate, you pay 8%. Under the law, you pay the highest rate allowed by law. It might be 18%. 
Um, find some experts. Some judges will allow you to bring in experts on fiduciary duties. Um, a lot of judges won't. Um, I, I don't use them very often. Probably about, probably now about 25% of the time. I used to use them all the time. The problem with using them is the lawyer on the other side is going to be able to flip them and score points against your client where in areas where he did breach, such as a disclosure or something of that nature. Okay, you're fighting the fight. Who sues first is a big issue in my mind. I want to go first always. So if I've got a trustee who thinks he may be in some trouble, I may start the fight with a declaratory judgment action or an accounting suit. And the reason I do that is to try and be able to to be the plaintiff. Now, there's some law that says you can't really do that and you're, it's liable to get flipped, but uh, I've done it and, and I would try and do it in almost every case. Arbitration available. Well, there are some trust agreements where there's no question arbitration will be available because the, the uh, successor trustee comes in and negotiates it with the beneficiaries. You guys have probably all heard of the Rachel V. Wright's case where the Supreme Court says if it's in a trust agreement and you've accepted benefits, you're bound by it. Arbitration can be a good thing. Uh, I personally don't like it, but it scares plaintiffs. And it definitely removes a layer of punitive risk. Uh, and so if you think the damages are low, but the punitive damage risk is high, I would definitely try to go to arbitration. No decision yet on whether arbitration in a will would apply. Um, it seems to me the same acceptance of benefits argument could be made, uh, hasn't been in Texas. Trial by judge or jury, that's gonna depend on the judge. Um, statutory probate judges deal with these a lot. Um, I think they can be pretty rough on, on fiduciaries, especially in round two and three. Uh, a district judge who's not uh, as familiar with these cases might look at the business judgment rule, might have that in their mind, might guide him. I've seen some judges hammer fiduciaries just um, way beyond I would have expected. And I've been the benefit on both sides of that in trials with a judge. Personally, I would not try, I would not represent a fiduciary in a trial before a judge. I would want a, a, um, a, a jury almost every case. Who are the parties? Guys, this is important because most of the time you don't, people sue the wrong person. You've got to sue the trustee in their individual capacity or the managing partner in their individual capacity. When the plaintiff sues you in your representative capacity, they're making a mistake because they're not getting damages against you individually. So you want to make sure to treat it as if they've sued you in that representative capacity. But one thing, the last thing I'm going to mention is a great way to nip these cases in the bud is to focus on who's getting the damages. Because in almost every instance, the damages go to the trust or to the partnership. And the beneficiary or the partner isn't going to get the individual damages, that causes them to lose the vigor, their vigor for the case. Thanks, folks.